welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. During the presentation, to ask a question from the phone line, please press star then 1. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the meeting over to Janice Wango. You may begin. Thank you. Welcome to the International Trade Administration's China IP webinar. This morning, this very cold morning in D.C., we're very happy to have Mr. J James Hayes of the Beijing law firm Tian Hao with us to give us a presentation on Chinese IP court data. Um, many people who work in China have heard anecdotal stories about court cases. Um, Mr. Hayes has looked at the data and will give us his insights on the data that's been posted on the Supreme People's Court website. Uh, just a little bit of background about Mr. Hayes. He's admitted to practice um, from the PTO. He's a registered patent lawyer here in the United States, um, and he's with the Beijing office of uh, Tian Hao, who has a very strong intellectual property uh, practice. So without further ado, I'll let Mr. Haynes begin with his presentation. All right. Thank you, Janice. Uh, first, all of you should see a little dot above the, the word court here. We're going to be going through a lot of tables and, and charts and it'll it'll certainly be helpful to know where I am on those charts. And we will be talking about the court data. We've been collecting court data for about four or five years now uh, off of the, the Supreme Court website. Actually, there's two websites, one just for Beijing data and one for uh, IP court data from the rest of the country. So you, you, there's also administrative cases and criminal cases and other kinds of cases, but that's not included in, in this uh, presentation. This is just the court data. So you use this data really in two main ways. One is to see just how uh, the Chinese are doing with enforcement. Uh, and you would use that whether you want to file patents or trademarks in China, whether you want to take your IP over to China, those kind of decisions. It's certainly useful to know whether you can protect your uh, IP in the courts. The second way you can use this data is if you are litigating in China. And as we found out, it's, China's a great place to do forum shopping, so you can use this data to do that. So first let's start out and talk about the, uh, the first aspect, and that's just how well China is enforcing their IP in the courts. Now, our database is on both the patent cases copyright cases and trademark cases. We're going to just look at the patent cases in detail here uh, just due to time, but we also have, uh, and we'll have a summary at the end of, of all three case types. But on the patent cases, you can see here we have six, uh, over 6,000 cases, and they're broken down into types of cases. On the right side is the percent of total cases. So you can see 85% of the patent cases are infringement cases, so, so by and large there's infringement cases, but there's also appeals from the uh, administrative uh, uh, rulings, ownership disputes, licensing disputes, et cetera. So if we look at uh, what are decided in these cases, here's our, our different case types again on the, on the left. In infringement cases, here's the number won, the number lost, how many withdrew, and arbitrated. Arbitrated means the judge will be involved in the decision. He'll, he'll you know, give damages and he'll, uh, and write that up in, in, his, uh, in his description of the case. So you can see uh, that most of the cases are not ruled on, but about 41% of the cases the judge will rule either a win or a loss. Uh, most of the cases are withdrawn, 47%. 12% uh, are arbitrated. And some cases are stayed for an invalidity action. Generally, the, the, the judges go ahead. Even if you file that a, uh, if it's an invention patent, if you file that it's uh, invalid, they'll generally go ahead with the, with the case. Here's looking just at the infringement uh, cases. They're, they're the ones that we were interested in for the various years and the first instance and the appeal. You can see there's a, uh, over a 1,000 first instance cases for those years with an 80% win rate. Now, this is uh, a very high win rate, a lot higher than uh, uh, in many countries. And, and the appeal win rate is 76%. So 
on first blush, looking at whether or not the Chinese courts are enforcing the patents. Yes, they're, they're enforcing them quite well. If you, in fact, we, uh, I'm quite active in the American Chamber of Commerce and in China, and we had a Supreme Court judge over, and he was he was actually kind of mad. He says the foreigners complain a lot about we're not enforcing IP, but they don't take the, their cases to court. And when they come to court, they win their cases. So he was encouraging uh, uh, foreign entities to to file cases in in the courts, and and this really holds that out that there's an 80 percent win rate. Uh, now on the appeals with a 76 percent win rate, this is a win rate for the patent owner. So uh, no matter which side appeal, this is the win rate for the uh, for the for the patent owner. Now, in China, there are three different types of patents. There's the design patents, there's the utility model patents, which the U.S. does not have. Uh, utility model patents are not examined. Uh, and there's the invention patent, which is like the U.S. utility patent. Kind of confusing. But if you break these out, you can see most of the cases are design cases. 52% of the cases are design cases. 31% are utility model cases. And only 17% are, are invention uh, invention patent cases, so um, that's interesting. Now, if you look at the win rate for the various types, that's also interesting. The design patent has an 84% win rate, so higher than average. Uh, next, the utility model patent has a lower win rate than the design patents at 78%, and the invention patents have the lowest at only a 72% win rate. Now, it, it seems a little unusual that invention patents, which are examined, uh, and, and by the patent office have a lower win rate than utility model patents, which don't even go through examination. And, and uh, it, it seems pretty questionable. Why is this? Well, uh, one reason for that, and, and what we think is the reason, is that utility model patents, they're not examined, uh, but by the time the judge goes to make a rule on it, they have been looked at by the patent office, and the patent office has said that they are a valid patent. So since they haven't been examined from the beginning, their claims are probably broader. So it would be harder to prove that you weren't infringing. Um, so that's why we think that they have a higher win rate than the invention patents. Also, you can break down the data into different patent types. Uh, and these are sorted. So we have computer hardware, mechanical, electrical, et cetera. Uh, just broad classifications of technologies, and they're sorted here on the win rate. So there are only two computer hardware cases, but the patent owner both both won, so for 100 percent. Mechanical patents, 83 percent win rate. Uh, electrical, 69, and on down to pharmaceuticals, which only had a 43 percent win rate. So this is also useful to determine whether or not you want to uh, file those types of patents in in China. Another often asked question is, if I'm a foreigner and I'm suing in Chinese courts, am I going to be treated the same as, as a Chinese, or, or will I be treated worse or, or better? Do I have a better or worse chance? So we took a look at this uh, for both first instance and appeals, and whether you're the plaintiff or the defendant. So, for example, if you're a plaintiff, you're a foreigner suing a Chinese for infringement, uh, there were 133 cases, 75% win rate, whereas for over 1,000 cases for the Chinese, there was an 81% win rate. So that immediately brings up the question, well, is that a difference, 75% uh, wins versus 81% wins? Can you say there's there's a difference? And, and the way to look at that is using the chi-square uh, probability test. And you can think of this as, uh, a way to see what is the percent chance that, that there is a, a one type of difference. For example, say you had a coin, and you're not sure whether the coin's weighted on one side or not, whether it's a fair coin, so you flip it, and you get heads 75% of the time. So is that a fair coin, 75% heads? Well, the question you need to ask is how many times did you flip it? If you only flipped it four times and it came up heads three times, well, it may very well be and probably is a fair coin. But if you flipped it a 1,000 times and it came up heads 750 times, well, the the, uh, the tail side is probably weighted, so it will come up with heads more often, so it's not a fair coin. 
Well, that's what the chi-square probability test does. It, it takes the number of, of, uh, of cases and determines whether or not statistically this would be uh, a difference that would matter. And traditionally, statisticians say anything less than 5% uh, is probably not caused by random distribution, that there is something taking place to make a difference. So here it's 15%, so there is no significant difference uh, if you're the plaintiff, whether you're a foreigner or a Chinese. But if you're a defendant, meaning that a Chinese entity is suing you, a foreign entity, for infringement, there are only eight cases, but the defendant won, and this is uh, uh, a win rate for the defendant, the defendant won 62% of the time if they're a foreigner, and the defendant only won 19% of the time if they were Chinese. So here there is a, a, a huge uh, statistical difference uh, in that there is a significant difference that, in effect, the foreigners are getting a lot better results out of the courts than, uh, than the Chinese themselves are. If you look at the appeal, you see the same thing uh, holds up. If you're the uh, IP owner and you're appealing, you have a 70% chance versus 69% chance, no statistical difference. But if you're the uh, if you're the non-IP owner and you're appealing, there were 14 cases and the foreigner won all of them. Uh, that is that uh, an IP owner was doing them for infringement and the uh, Chinese IP owner lost on, on all the cases. So, in effect, there you should not uh, uh, not file a lawsuit in China because you think you may be treated differently. Because, if anything, the data shows that you're treated better. Also, damages is something that that you're uh, that that we're interested in. Damages in China are quite low. Here's a chart of the various years. If we go all the way over over to the right, uh, we can see the damages sought. So one thing that's interesting is that, first of all, there's not much damages being requested. You see the average is only 58,000 U.S. dollars. So, <clears throat> so damage seeking is very low. And if you look at the average damage being awarded, that depends on how you calculate damages. So, for example, if you include zero, that you won your case, but the judge didn't give any damages, then the average is, is uh, 50, about 15,000 U.S. dollars. If you exclude those zeros, uh, you, you take out uh, uh, any zero damage awards, then the average is $17,000. Also, there's a lot of cases uh, where here's some graphs of the damages award. You can see there's one or very few cases uh, where large damages were given, most of the damages are quite low. So if, for example, in 2006, there are only five cases over 1 million rem and So if you take out those large damage awards, then, and, and you include the zeros, you have uh, over about 9,000 and about 10,000 if you take out the zeros. So when you're looking for what kind of average damages you could expect from a case, well, that depends on whether you think there's a chance for a large award or not, and whether you think if you win, the judge would get it, give anything or not. You, you would pick one of those damages. So that's pretty much an overview of, whether, of, of how China is enforcing their, their IP, and, and the answer is yes. If you take a, a case to the court, it looks like that China is doing quite a good job in enforcing IP through the, through the courts. Now let's take a closer look at the data uh, in, in light of whether, if you're going to sue uh, in China, what, what can this data, how can this data help you? First, you might want to look at the, the provinces and see differences in, in provinces. So on the left here is a list of, uh, of, of the different provinces. They're sorted according to the win rate in the provinces. So you can see there are some provinces such as Guangxi, 100% win rate, but only one case, so only a few cases, but high win rates on some of the provinces. Next is the probability, and again, this is the chi-square statistical probability. So this is the probability that this province is different than the other provinces. And uh, if that's uh, 
below 5%, then, then the difference is, is significant. So also, the average win rate is 80%. So all of these provinces with, with a blue background have a win rate that's higher than average, and all of the provinces below 80% uh, are lower than average. And there are only two provinces that stand out as being significantly different than the rest of the, the provinces, and it's quite surprising. Those are Beijing and Shanghai. I have statistically less win rates than any of the other other provinces in China. So this is this was actually quite shocking when we first discovered this because we were telling all of our clients, oh, we want you to you, you should probably be suing in Beijing and Shanghai. Whereas when we actually looked at the data, those were actually the two provinces you should not be suing in. So that that was quite interesting. Of course, you're really not interested in what province to sue in. What you're really interested in, what court you could, you should be in. So you can do the same scenario. Here's all of the courts listed um, uh, in, in the win rates and whether in the statistical uh, probability of, uh, uh, of the chi-square test. And what we have highlighted or bolded that you can read are only those courts that are statistically different than the rest of the courts. And you can see two courts are in the blue as being statistically better than the rest of the courts, and there are a number of courts in the red that are statistically worse for the courts. Here we've got the Beijing second intermediate and the Beijing first intermediate are both statistically worse. Uh, the Shanghai second intermediate is statistically worse. Um, the Shanghai first intermediate is not on, on the statistically worse uh, list, but also of interest. In, of interest here, we have the Zhou uh, uh the, the Jinhua Intermediate Court, statistically better. But we also have, uh, uh, well, we don't have the. Here's the Jiangsu Court is statistically worse, and the Jiangsu Wuxi Court is statistically better. So in Jiangsu Province, you have. Uh, one court that's statistically better and one court that's statistically worse. So that's an interesting uh, thing to see that one province can have two such different courts. So th this data can be used to help with the court selection. You can also do the same thing for judges. Here's the, there are over 417 judges that uh, have ruled on IP cases. And what's listed here are just the judges that are statistically better or statistically worse uh, from the other judges. You can see in blue the, the better judges and in red uh, are the judges that have ruled uh, worse. At the top here, uh, 29 cases, the judge ruled uh, in favor of the IP owner for all 29. So some judges are quite uh, IP friendly. And you can also do the same thing for law firms to help. It, sometimes it's a good idea to get a local law firm, and this can help with a selection of law firms that are particularly successful in their, in their local jurisdiction. So that's a, a quick look or, or a look down through the data of the patent cases. And now we'll just look also at trademark and copyright to, uh, to briefly examine whether they show the, uh, generally the same trends. And here we have over 15,000 cases from, uh, from copyrights, 4,000, trademarks about 4,000, patents about 6,000. And uh, again, the win rates are higher in, in the first instance, 89% win rates for trademarks and copyrights uh, in the first instance. And in the appeals, 80% for trademarks. And look at this, 94% win rate on appeal for the IP owner. Uh, on copyright cases, so appeal your case if, if you lose in the first instance, which it looks like you would win in the first instance uh, also with an 89% win rate. Again, if you look at the foreign versus Chinese, combining all uh, the patent, trademark, and, and copyright cases, you see the same, <clears throat> same trend. that if you're the plaintiff, uh, there is no statistical difference uh, between 
being a foreigner or being a Chinese. But if you're the defendant, there's a strong uh, tendency for the foreigner to win much more often than the Chinese will win. And the same on the appeals. In the uh, first instance, no difference. And in the uh, – or if you're the IP owner, there's no statistical difference. But if you're the non-IP owner, then there is a statistical difference in the foreigner. Here, 74% win rate if you're the foreigner uh, versus only a 33% win rate uh, if you're the defendant or if you're the non-IP owner on a case. So that's a, a rundown of the data, and now I think we have time for some questions. Once again, to ask a question, please press star then 1. One moment for our question. We do have a question from Hun, from Hun Jung Kim. Yes, uh, I'm not sure exactly what's the difference between invention and utility model. Well, uh, there, the difference is how they're examined. The invention patent is examined by the patent office. They look to see. <clears throat> the references, whether it, indeed it's inventive uh, or not, whereas the utility model patent is more like a registration. The U.S. doesn't have this type of patent, but uh, European countries do, uh, Germany particularly. China really modeled their patent law off of the German patent law, so adopted these utility model patents. Uh, and they're not examined. You, you have a patent, they'll just be looked at to make sure the uh, the formal filing is okay, and then you'll be granted a patent on on your invention. And if you then bring that to sue, if someone sues you, uh, or if you sue someone for infringing your patent, at that time the patent office then will look at the patent to see whether or not it uh, it, it appears valid and inventive. Okay, so. Invention is like U.S. utility patent. That's right. So when That's you right. try to file application for invention, because we wanted to file some utility patent in China, we should use the invention. But utility model is like more like you know copyright registration. So after we file against uh, other parties based on you know infringement of utility model, and then the China PTO can take a look at whether or not this. Uh, utility is valid or whatever. Yes. What, what happens if, if you're filing for infringement on a utility model, uh, when you take your case to the court, you also have to apply for a search report from the patent office. And the patent office will, will supply that search report to the judge. Um, and also, if the, uh, the defendant wants to file an invalidity on the utility model. The judge will stay that case. So he'll wait on that case uh, until the uh, inv until the uh, invalidity action is completed in the patent office. Where if, if it's an invention patent and you file an invalidity action with the patent office, the judge will tend to just continue on with the case and not wait for the results. Okay. And so invention in China is like, you know, you put a patent in the U.S. So when I file against, you know, other party for infringement of this invention, the defendant should prove that their product is not infringing our invention, right? That's right. It's exactly the same like U.S., okay. That's right. It, and it's really the same with utility model patents also. Uh, if, if you file an invention patent in China, you can file it as either a utility model patent or an invention pa <clears throat> invention patent. Okay. 
And uh, there's really, you know, the, the U.S. companies aren't very familiar with utility model patents, but there's actually quite good reason for them. They're inexpensive. You get them very quickly. You, you have them, you know, in uh, eight eight months to a, a year, you'll have your patent, which is enforceable. It's actually more enforceable than an invention patent because in uh, when judging uh, uh, inventiveness, an invention patent has to have substantive uh, improvement over the prior art, whereas a utility model patent only has to have some improvement over the prior art. So, uh, so in, uh, utility model patents are something that U.S. patent filers in China should, should be familiar with, I believe. How long is it going to take if I file invention patent in China? In the U.S., it takes like four years after the right. to get approval. How long usually it takes in China? Of course, it, it varies with discipline, but China made a strong effort uh, several years ago to bring down the pendency rate and hired a lot of examiners and brought it down from the four, four or five years pendency down to 22 months. Uh, and uh, then it's it's worked up now. It's about 24 because they they saw oh we you know we brought the pendency down, but we also need to be thinking about quality too. So they they're kind of holding it where it is as they're working on quality issues. Um, uh, so it, it, it averages is quite fast now 20, 22 24 month average. And it's effective for 20 years, like you. Yes, the invention is 20 years. The utility model is only 10 years. Uh, that's something that needs to be considered. And also, uh, utility models are not for no uh, uh, method claims or chemical compounds. So mainly just devices is, is type type claims. But they're great for electronics, right, which right. have a short lifetime uh, anyway in the marketplace. Right, right. Okay, thank you so much. I really Good. appreciate it. Um, quite welcome. James, this is Janice. Yeah. I was just going to ask you, what would you advise clients who, who have an invention patent um, about filing a utility model um, in addition to? Well, it, it uh, that's one strategy. Under the new patent law, which was just uh, passed uh, last year, or let's see, we're, it would be the year before last now, uh, you can have both, but you need to file both at the same time. <laughs> so in one of them, then, would need to be coming, uh, like if you have a PCT, a lot of patents coming into China come through the PCT process. And uh, so through the PCT process, you can only file one or the other. So that means if you're going to file both, you've got to be within that the one year uh, 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 grace period from your original uh, filing. So that needs to be taken into consideration. But by filing both, you get really the best of both worlds in that you have an enforceable patent quite quickly, uh, yet then when, you're, you, when your invention patent issues, you would drop your utility model patent and then you'd have the long-term benefit of the uh, of the invention patent. So that, that, that's one good strategy if you want to have the ability to enforce quickly, get at the same time, one the long-term patent. Um, operator, Tori, do we have any other questions? At this time, I'm showing none. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question from the phone, please press star one. You know, one of the just speaking more about uh, utility model versus invention patents. One of the main costs of filing in China is the translation. So, of course, the uh, you'd use the same translation for both the invention and utility model. So, it doesn't cost that much more to uh, to file for both. The downside, of course, is that you need to to realize within one year of your priority filing that, that you want to file for both in China.
Any final yes. questions, please press star one. Um, James, just as a hypothetical, if you had a company out there that made sporting shoes, like sneakers, um, what would you advise them with, if they came to your office? Uh, of, of course, you would. It, it depends on what kind of thing it's going to protect. <clears throat> if it's the uh, trademarks, would 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 come to mind right away, and. You know, China is interesting in that here they are protecting their IP quite well, right, in the courts, 80% win rates, um, yet they have big IP infringement problems. So why is this? <clears throat> well, the reason is that you can have, you know, you can take your, your, your infringer to, to court and you can win your case, and that's fine if you have uh, two or three or five or ten infringers, but if you have a thousand, ten thousand infringers. Well, you you can't take all ten thousand to to court. So, uh, so you need to uh, you know use other means. And there's administrative actions you can you can take. And of course, if you can get criminal cases against infringers, that that certainly acts as more of a deterrent. So, uh, but be more active in the courts because Chinese don't like to be taken to the courts. Kind of China, there's, there's government corporate consortiums uh, in China is, is kind of how their economy uh, works. So uh, if you're, a, a, you know, one of the larger companies, you're part of a group of companies who work closely with the government to accomplish whatever it is that the government's goals are in a particular sector. So, for example, we want to, we want the, the uh, shoe industry to be, you know, making X number of shoes uh, by by uh, 2013. So, uh, and they'll go to the companies and figure out what those companies need to be able to make X number of shoes by 2013. And the companies will tell the government, "We need this," and the government will tell the companies, "Well, you know, we'll we'll give you what you need, but we want you to." Uh, work with us and obey all of the various rules, including IP, and we want you to not be infringing on, on IP. So companies that are in these consortiums will do really anything not to be labeled as an infringer because they're not looking really at their relationship with you or whether or not they have to pay you damages, but they're looking at their relationship with the government and, and with their inclusion in this whole um, uh, uh, government corporate consortium. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, power that a, a company, companies can have over Chinese uh, industry and Chinese companies uh, because of this. So certainly find out who the infringer is. If they're in such a consortium, uh, uh, you'll find one of two kinds of companies. Either they'll lay over and say, oh, we'll stop infringing. What is it that you want? Or by the same token, the Chinese government is telling companies, we want you to develop IP, we want you to enforce your IP, uh, we don't want you to, uh, you know, just not, just roll over to the foreigners if you think you have uh, a legitimate right uh, for IP, we want you to fight the foreigners. So either you'll get a Chinese defendant who is very cooperative, or you'll get a Chinese defendant that's a real dragon uh, that'll just fight you uh, all the way, because in both aspects, that's exactly what the Chinese government wants. So you need to determine who it is that your defendant is and uh, play the strategy from, from that. We do have another question from the phone. Great. Sean Zong, you may ask our question. Oh. Uh, hi, Mr. Hans. Uh, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, that's uh, very useful data. Uh, one quick question. Uh, do you have any data relating to the uh, enforcement of judgments? That is, uh, uh, how often can a party uh, to actually collect the uh, judgments? I don't, no. We, we don't have that data. Just uh, all that's on the website is uh, you know, is the judgment itself. Okay. There's, there's been a lot of discussion.
discussion, though, about enforcement uh, enforcement of judgments. Um, and uh, it, it really comes, first of all, in the past, judgments were routinely not enforced. Uh, just because companies were small, they could easily disappear and, and uh, you know, just close up and open up as another company. Uh, and the courts weren't as uh, as organized and, and really as, as as powerful as they are now. Mm-hmm. Our, our feeling now is if you get a judgment against a court or, or against a company by a court, uh, the judgment will be paid uh, the court has their own little court police that they'll send out and, and make sure that they get paid. And, and particularly if if you're going against a company that's in one of these consortiums, there's no way in the world they're going to want to be known as you know have a have a court um, judgment against them and, and 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 not have that paid. The, the government just really frowns on that. Mm-hmm. Of course, yeah, a company could just close up and everybody disappear, but. You'd be a little silly even going after them in the first place. Um, uh, although you can, the, the the court cases are very quick in China. By law, they need to be finished by in six months. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, if there's a foreigner involved, they give them more time. But but the average uh, time even for foreign cases is less than seven months. Um, so they're very quick, and because of that, they're very inexpensive. Uh, uh, there's there's no discovery process which or there's no formal discovery process which of course increases the cost substantially but there is a a uh, investigative process that should take place before the, the the case is filed because you just need to present your evidence to the court and they'll decide on the evidence that you present so you need to gather that evidence beforehand mm-hmm. okay okay thank you All right, you're welcome At this time, I show no questions. Well, while we wait for next questions, I just wanted to do a quick plug for um, upcoming webinars. We have webinars that are upcoming on both February 9th and February 14th. February 9th, we have a webinar. It will be at 2 p.m. on Eastern Time. Um, this this webinar is um, well by Mr. Sean Zhang. <laughs> And he's going to be talking about MIT's draft internet measures. Um, comments on those measures are due February 14th, a week um, a week a week from Monday. So I'm hoping everybody can log in um, on February 9th. If I will send out an announcement shortly. Thereafter, there's going to be a webinar on innovation on February 14th, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, um, and. Um, Again, we have a, a China admitted attorney um, who, will, who will talk about uh, China's um, innovation, um, indigenous innovation uh, process and legislation. Um, hopefully, that everybody can, can log in. He's on the West Coast, but people can log in at 1 o'clock and hear him, 1 o'clock Eastern on February 14th. For any final questions, please press star 1. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I'd like to thank Mr. Haynes of Tian Hao for, um, for his time this morning. It's very cold here in uh, Washington, D.C., and thank him for giving this presentation on the court data. Uh, Mr. Haynes has been very kind to say if you have any other questions, you may contact him at his email address, which is listed on the screen right there. Um, and also, this, this webinar will be posted on the stopfakes.gov website. Thank you again, and talk to you guys on February 9th and February 14th. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Janice. Thank you for participating on today's conference. You may disconnect at this time. Uh, James?